Hi, my name's Donna Weitzel, and I am going to be telling you about cool seasons beyond pansies. But before we get started, I'd like to let you know that if you have any questions, be sure and type them into the Q&A window. Also, we're going to be uh, recording this, so uh, you'll be receiving a link in your email uh, as a follow-up. So let's get started. I am a North Fulton Master Gardener and I live in Fulton County, Georgia. So everything I'm talking about will be pertinent to anybody who lives in zones nearby and we'll talk about that in a minute. What you're gonna learn today is all about growing pansies, but also you'll learn about cool season annuals, cool season herbs, as well as edibles and seeds that you can plant in the fall for late winter and early spring blooms. And finally, we'll talk about containers that you can put on your porch or patio, uh, beautiful arrangements in pots during the winter. So to start out, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what types of plants are out there. And if you know this, this will be a quick review. And if you don't, it's really important information. There are perennials, biennials, hardy, half hardy and tender annuals. And all of these um, have different needs for temperature. And so that's what we'll be talking about. The perennials um, are the mostly what you see in a garden that looks like a cottage garden or a, a garden that blooms throughout the whole summer with different kinds of plants. These plants live for three or more years. They're herbaceous plants, which means they're not like a shrub with woody stems. Example of a perennial would be a, a purple coneflower or a Shasta daisy, or as you see here, a black-eyed Susan. They go dormant in the winter and uh, so they're not doing any growing or blooming during the cold months, but under the ground, their roots are still alive and they're still growing. They have a specific season of bloom. So for instance, this black eyed Susan is going to bloom in the summer all the way into the end of the summer, beginning of fall. Um, and then it will be done for the season. The other type of flower that's not quite as well known is a biennial and a biennial lives for two years. The first year of the biennial is just leaves and the roots are getting established underground and the leaves are growing and photosynthesis is happening and they are um, becoming larger and ready for the second year when they put up their flowers and make seeds. And of course, every plant's desire and um, reason for being in life is to make seeds, to make new plants. So that's what's going on in the second year. As you can see, this foxglove has beautiful flowers and they will eventually turn into seeds, fall to the ground and make new plants. Now an annual lives for only one growing season and when you plant your annual, it's going to bloom continuously through, throughout that growing season. And in this case, we're going to have hopefully plants that bloom in the winter. Now, hardy annuals are the ones that can survive freezing temperatures. And here's an example above that pansy, but ornamental cabbage, ornamental kale, a lot of herbs, they are all um, able to live through winter temperatures. They're reliable in our gardens in Georgia throughout the winter. But when the heat happens and it gets kind of hot out, they will decline and it, they are done for the season. Half hardy annuals are not as well known, but we also call them cool season annuals. And if they have a little winter protection, they will bloom beautifully throughout the entire winter here in Georgia. An example is uh, this pot marigold here that you can see with the orange flowers. It can withstand light frost and it grows best in cooler temperatures. And then again, when the heat happens, the plant is done and it will decline. But finally, the last kind of annuals are called tender annuals and they do not do well in our uh, cold weather in the winter. 
they grow where temperatures are warm. So these are your summer annuals, such as uh, begonias, impatiens, marigolds, zinnias. And these are the ones you see all over Georgia in the summertime. But when the temperatures get cold, they will die because they cannot withstand frost. Now, if, if all the information I've just given you is here at a glance, the first line going across the life of a plant, remember a perennial is three or more years, a biennial is a two-year plant, and then all of the annuals are just one season. But the temperatures for each type of plant, um, they vary. Perennials can live year round and they can be evergreen, but some may go dormant and even disappear where they'll come back up in the spring. But biennials live year round, the first year with the leaves, second year with the flower, and then the hardy annuals and the half hardy annuals like cool temperatures, but the tender annuals have to have warm or hot temperatures. And finally at the bottom going across, how do we use these plants in the winter time? Well, if you have a perennial that is an evergreen perennial, meaning that the leaves are still green throughout the winter, then, or they might get flowers and be winter bloomers, they can be used very beautifully in your yard and landscape during the winter. Biennials, the first year have green leaves, which are, are very nice to have. And the second year, you'll see flowers in the late winter, early spring. Hardy annuals, yes. Use those in your landscape for sure. And then half hardy annuals will need a little protection if it's a very hard frost, but they can take temperatures all the way to 20 degrees. But don't try to grow tender annuals because it won't be successful in our winter months. So we have our zone. And if you know what your zone is, that's great. If you don't, you'll need to figure it out because it will tell you the range in temperatures that are the lowest that you will go in your state or area. For here, we live in zone 7B and we get down to five degrees, which happens very rarely, but yes, it did happen about seven years ago and everybody's pipes burst. So I know it's not a usual thing, but sometimes it will affect the plants that we grow. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this uh, talk that I'm giving today, if you're in 7A, 7B, 8, and even part of 6B, you can do all of the things that we're talking about in terms of winter landscape plants. Now we love our pansies and you see them everywhere in pots, in landscape, in gardens, and they're perfect for our winters because we grow pansies in pots and we grow them in mass plantings and we put them at the edge of our uh, existing flower beds and they add a beautiful color for our winter. They're very reliable. Now pansies have been around believe it or not, for hundreds of years, and they've been loved by everyone. Pensée, which is a French word, means thought. And the language of flowers, which in the Victorian times, if, if you got a flower from someone, there was a message with that flower, and it had a deep meaning. Sentimental thoughts or even amorous thoughts are associated with pansies. So if you received a pansy, somebody loved you. Even in um, the year 1600, when Shakespeare wrote Hamlet, his character Ophelia says, there is pansies, that's for thoughts. So this has been going on for a long, long time. We're not the first ones to use pansies. It's developed from a wild violet called heart's ease. That's Ophelia's pansy. And the modern pansy today was actually developed in 1810 by T. Thompson, who was a gardener to Lord Cambier of Buckinghamshire. And after he developed this pansy, it was so successful that by 1825, there were 400 varieties. And I can't even imagine how many varieties there are today. But yes, pansies are very popular and they're very uh, easy to grow. But let's uh, get a little further into the pansy world here. We have pansies, we have violas, and we have Johnny Jump Ups. They're all in the same family, 
and they can use, be, be used interchangeably in your landscape, in your pots, in your containers, on your deck or patio. But the most cold hardy ones are violas in the middle and Johnny Jump Ups because they are closest to the original pansy, Ophelia's pansy heartsies. Pansies versus violas. Well, everybody has their favorite, but the pansies, the ones with the great big blossoms on them, they actually need six hours of direct sunlight. So there are some stipulations there if you're gonna grow them. They have fewer blooms per plant, but the blooms are bigger. They need to be deadheaded, which means you're going to pinch off that spent flower. So another one will take its place. They're very slow to recover after a hard freeze, but they are reliable in our landscape. They will not die during the winter, but they may stop blooming for a while if it gets really cold. Violas, on the other hand, are smaller, or the blooms are smaller, more blooms per plant, and they can tolerate a little bit of shade. So if you don't get six hours of sunlight, make sure you get violas uh, if that's what you're choosing. They will also be self-cleaning, so there's no need to deadhead them, and they recover quickly after a freeze. Now, there are two types of pansies in terms of what they look like. This is called clear on the left, and that's just one color. And the one on the right is called blotched, and they have those little dark faces that people just love to see. The viola wetrachiana is the modern pansy. This evolved from viola tricolor, that Johnny jump up we saw a minute ago. There are so many series that um, people have hybridized and developed so that we can have different kinds of pansies um, at our fingertips at the garden center. The broadest color selection are, is the Delta series. The Majestic Giant series, they've developed four inch flowers with the dark blotch center. Um, the Crown series, there are um, only nine clear colors. That's without the face but they flower much earlier than the others. The Antique Shade series. This one has muted colors and blotched faces. And finally, the Crystal Bowl series. There are clear colors with 11 cultivars. And I just bought some of these at the garden center the other day. Beautiful colors available. Now, if you look at this a title at the top of the slide, Success with Pansies in the Winter Landscape, a guide for landscape professionals. I know many of you watching are just homeowners or avid gardeners and you're not a professional, but this is something that you can uh, download from the UGA publications. And if you're interested in putting in a huge mass planting of pansies, as you see in the, the front of some of the um, housing areas, by their sign or in front of um, maybe an office building, really beautiful uh, pansies that have been planted in uh, rows. And this will tell you how to do it. And you don't wanna buy 10 flats of pansies and then have them die on you. So this gives you an, uh, some of the techniques that you, you'll need to use if you're gonna put in a mass uh, planting of pansies. To snap a photo of this publication and you'll find it in the UGA um, extension website. Another one is pansies, violas, and more. Getting the most out of the winter color beds. A lot of what I'm talking about came from this uh, publication. Dr. Bodhi Panisi, who is um, at the Department of Horticulture at the University of Georgia, wrote this. It's very well written and easy to understand and it's gonna list other winter perennials and annuals that you can use. Um, many of them I'm gonna tell you about, and it'll offer tips on growing pansies. So these are two publications that are really good for you to, to use if you're a pansy lover and you're gonna put a lot of pansies in, in your yard. When you're planting them, plant pansies mid to late October. You can plant them now, it's still early November. We're gonna have 70 degrees this week. But make sure that when you plant them, the soil is not too cold. Add organic matter to the bed, 
compost, manure, or even um, chopped up leaves, because you want that to be a fluffy uh, soil that is going to support the roots and the plant. The soil pH, now this should be about 5.4 to 5.8. If you have a perennial garden, it's about 6.0. So it's a little, little bit more acidic than a perennial garden. But our Georgia soil is acidic to start with. If you're not sure about your pH, you can do a soil test. And this is something that you can get from the University of Georgia Extension Office, your county extension office. They have a little soil bag. You put your soil in it, you send it into them, and they will tell you exactly what your pH is and what you need to do to change it. If you do a soil test and you add iron sulfate or aluminum sulfate, that will lower your pH. And you have to do it correctly to get the right amount in the soil. Now, after you're plant, you've planted your pansies and you want to fertilize them, go to your garden center and get a high nitrate pansy fertilizer. Don't use the blue stuff that you used in the summer because it's not going to work in the winter months. If you can't find pansy fertilizer, you can try calcium, magnesium, or potassium nitrate. And those will uh, be something that your pansies can take up and give them nutrition, do the nutrients that they need throughout the winter. Now, we've talked enough about pansies and I promised you I would tell you a beyond pansies. So here we go. Let's see what else you can plant. Well, there are other flower choices and many of these are grown from seed. So hang on to your hats because most people don't know about this and this is really good information. If you look on the left here, you see hardy annuals. All of those are hardy annuals. They bloom um, in the late winter, early spring. They live throughout the, the winter month growing, getting their roots down, ready to put up their flowers. The ones on the right are half hardy. These are the ones that are reliable as well in our Georgia winter months. So let's get started talking about each one of these plants. You're going to sow the seeds in the fall for these annuals. Poppies that are California poppies, alyssum, Calendula, calendula, which is pot marigold. I showed you a picture of that earlier. This one is a, a sweet peas and it's actually not peas at all. It's flowers and we'll talk about those in a minute. And then there's Iceland poppies, bachelor's buttons, forget-me-nots and larkspur. And all of these are available at your garden center. And you take this package of seeds and if they're tiny, tiny, tiny little seeds that you can't even see or control them with your fingertips, put them in some dry sand, shake them up, and you can see the sand as you sprinkle that onto your garden and you'll know where the seeds are going. A lot of these don't need any, um, they don't need any soil on top, they need light to germinate. So we'll talk about each one of these as well. But I wanted you to know these are not hard to find. You just go to the garden center and there are the seeds that I'm talking about. This is baby's breath. If you've ever gotten a bouquet of roses, there, oftentimes there's baby's breath stuck in there and it's kind of a frilly white flower. It also comes in purple and rose, which is less um, likely that you'll see that with roses, but you can plant seeds directly into the soil in the fall and they will grow to be one to two feet high. They bloom for about six weeks. So if you want more than six weeks, you just do two plantings of them. But be sure and look at what you're buying because Gypsophilia elegans is the Latin name for this flower I'm talking about. There's also a Gypsophilia paniculata and that's a perennial, and that's not what we're talking about. So it doesn't grow as easily in this uh, planting with seeds as this one, but it's a sure bet to have nice white flowers in your garden or even in a pot in the winter. Larkspur is my favorite. 
And as you can see, it just looks like a cottage garden that you'd see maybe in England. And there's sweet smelling, you can cut them, you can use them as uh, flowers in a vase in your house. They do need full sun, although they can take a little shade. And it, it gives you the old fashioned garden effect. If you have a perennial garden and it's dormant during the winter, sprinkle some of these seeds around and up will come these gorgeous flowers. And then when the perennials are starting to emerge, these guys are done and you just pull them out. It's not a delphinium, although it looks like one. It's in that family, but delphiniums we treat as annuals here in Georgia. They don't do well in our hot summers. So try larkspur and sprinkle it around. You'll just love what you see. The calendulas I talked about earlier, the pot marigolds, they range in height from one to two feet. Now you can actually eat these flowers. You can put them in a salad, which is just going to make everybody surprised, right? But they tend to be gold and yellow in their uh, color, and they're half hardy annuals, so they need full sun and they need neutral soil to acidic soil, just like um, we have in Georgia. You can plant the seeds in the fall for your cool season flowers, and that would be such a lovely addition to a winter landscape. The foxglove that I showed you earlier is a biennial, self-seeding, and often you can buy the second year flower in the spring, and I'm talking about actually late winter, I'm talking about February in the garden center. The one you see on the left in the picture, um, I planted that in the fall and it came up in the spring. The one you see on the right, that one was growing all winter and um, it came up with several plants, with several uh, flower spikes. It's, it's just such a showy plant that um, I think you should try to include it in your garden for the winter. Oriental poppies are magnificent. And as you can see this kind of tissue paper looking petal and the interesting center, they are eye-catching and you can put this anywhere in your garden where people walk up to your house and they'll say, wow, what is that? It's about two to three feet tall, so it's a pretty showy plant. The leaves are going to stay green throughout the winter and um, the flowers will bloom in late winter, early spring. You can get these in white or coral or pink, but the red is the most vivid. And these are perennials in colder climates. But again, George is a little too hot for them. So we treat them as annuals. You can try Shirley poppies from seed. And I'm gonna talk about that right now. These are Shirley poppies and they are red as well, but they're, they're a little bit shorter and less showy than the oriental poppies. They're also called corn poppies and Flanders poppies from Flanders Fields, World War I, where we um, Memorial Day um, came after World War I. And people often wear one of these Shirley poppies on their shirt to commemorate um, those that died in World War I. This is the Iceland poppy. And it's got crinkly, beautiful petals. Again, you just sprinkle these seeds in the soil in early fall and you'll have late winter spring blooms. And finally, the California poppies. Um, California poppies come in different colors. This is a picture of the orange ones, but they're just really cute. They're very short and they will, you could sprinkle the seeds throughout your garden and they would come up and uh, give you some color before your perennials bloom. An English daisy is a happy little plant that needs to be put in a pot, not in the ground, because it doesn't like our acid soil, but it certainly would like some good container mix in your pot. You can get this in white or pink or um, even red, and they all have little yellow centers. So they've got a, a nice look for winter. Um, you want full sun for these, maybe a little bit of shade, but they, they don't get very tall. They get just about, six to eight inches. And 
you want to put them in the front of your border if you are putting them in the ground and you've made it not quite an acid soil. But I like to put them in pots. They're perennials, so make sure if you buy them as a plant, you get that second year plant that has the leaves ready to um, make a flower. Oops, we'll go the other way. Now, um, there's our poppies, there's our daisy, and here's our money plant, Lunaria. Lunaria is a plant that is also a biennial, and the first year you're going to get leaves, and it will stay green all winter. The second year you're going to get these pink, purple flowers that you see on the left, but the real showstopper for this plant is in the fall. After, uh, at the end of that second year, you'll get these disc looking seed pods and people love to grow them for the seed pods and then cut them off and use them for dried arrangements. Children like these too. They think they're really fun to look at and, and touch the, the seed pods. So that's a fun plant to grow. Sweet William, which is also called Dianthus. Um, it's a variety of Dianthus. It gets pretty tall, a um, couple feet. So if you wanna have something in your garden that's a little bit taller and showier, this is the one for you. You can get it in red or pink or white. And it even comes in burgundy. So there's a, a lot of colors that you can incorporate into your pots or into your landscape. You got to deadhead it though. So as the blooms fade, pinch them off and a new bloom will happen. Remember when I told you plants want to make seeds? Well, that's what these flowers are doing. They, as soon as the flower is done, the seeds are being made. So take off that so you'll get more flowers. Strong winds though will blow this over. So protect it from strong winds and um, it's best in a pot or in a landscape area that is fairly neutral soil. Now look at this little primrose. This little primrose, I have one of these growing in a pot. It's three or four years old and it's just happy in that pot. And every late winter, it gets a flower. And you, if you grow primrose, you can get these happy little flowers in pink or fuchsia, white, yellow, cream, purple. They even come in orange. And um, they will stop blooming if it gets too cold. They will stop blooming if it gets too hot. So they have a temperature range that they like, but the leaves stay green and um, they like to be watered, have nice moist soil. So you could try them in a woodland setting um, under some shrubs. They're, they're just really delightful little flowers that you can smile at every time you see them. Now, snapdragons have become very popular in the winter here in, in the Atlanta area. And they do need full sun, but they can take a little bit of shade. But lots of people put them in pots or even in their landscape. And if you're putting down seeds, you don't even cover them. You just sprinkle them right on top of the soil and they will start to germinate with light on them. After your plants have established and started growing and they're getting flowers, these beautiful spikes will come up and the snapdragons are called snapdragons because you can pinch the blossom and the, the petals open and close like a little dragon, <laughs> like his mouth. But you can get these in very tall varieties, which are spiky and you can get them in medium height. There are dwarf ones and even trailing ones that hang over the front of a pot. So there, make sure you check out what you're buying when you get your snapdragons, but do incorporate them because they're very beautiful in our gardens all the way into spring. You can have them in many colors from maroon or bicolored or even pink, purple, orange, yellow, or white. And they do self-seed. As I said, everybody wants to make seeds when they're a flower. So the seeds fall into the soil and new snapdragons will emerge. My advice though, take out those volunteers, we call them, the ones that have come from seed because sometimes the colors aren't true and they may not be as hardy as those you would start from seed or buy at a nursery. So make sure you get some snapdragons. 
Now, here's something you might not be familiar with, and this is called a Chinese forget-me-not. This picture here was taken at one of the um, Atlanta Botanical Garden tours at somebody's house, and they had these growing all along the front of a, a, a shrub area, a border. They were just beautiful. Um, and they have these sky blue flowers, although you can get them in other colors, rose colored and white, but the blue is the bluest sky blue I've ever seen in a flower. And you just sprinkle the seeds down and you cover them lightly in full sun and you'll get this gorgeous um, production of green and then the flowers will emerge in the late winter. But if you don't have full sun and you still want forget-me-nots, don't despair because you can have this type. Myosotis sylvatica, which is a, it's called forget-me-nots, but it's a different plant altogether. It requires a little bit of shade. So there you go. You can have these blue flowers that bloom early spring or late fall. If you put the seeds right in the ground, they also need light to germinate. So don't cover them with soil, just sprinkle them in, press them into the soil, and they look so beautiful growing in between the spring bulbs that are gonna come up you know, in mid-February, the daffodils and the tulips, the hyacinths and the crocuses. These just add a beautiful background for those bright colors. Now, this is not bright colors, as you can see, this is gray. But if you want your colors to be showcased, your pinks and your yellows and your purples, then you need something that will make the colors just pop out. And that's a Dusty Miller. We love it for its whitish silver woolly leaves. And as you can see, they look kind of fuzzy and they also can be dried. I don't think people know about this, but you can dry these and bring them in and put them in an arrangement that's a dried arrangement in your house. They're also a wonderful companion to any color and they add um, a sense of texture as well. But they do get flowers toward the end of the summer because they're going to last all the way through these uh, dusty millers. Pinch off the flowers because they're sort of insignificant. We like them for the leaves. And try this in containers. Try it in your garden bed. Um, it's a really, really good plant that is reliable and has a lot of uses. Sweet alyssum is another one that you can just sprinkle those seeds and don't cover because they germinate with light. And it's got that frothy, frilly, white, um, delicate look. And the colors come in white, but also in rose or even a light purple. And they all decline in the heat, but they look beautiful in pots. They look wonderful next to pansies. And if you plant kale or cabbages, this just sets it off with, with that frilly white beside it. So um, sweet alyssum is a, a wonderful one to incorporate in your landscape or pots. This is called stock. Some people call it gilly flower, but stock is one that if you've ever received um, a winter bouquet from a florist, you probably had stock in it. It smells wonderful. It's the best smelling flower and it's a beautiful flower. It has so many colors available and it's, um, it's hardy here in Georgia in the winter, but it doesn't do well in the heat. So try growing some stock. Wallflower is another one that we aren't that familiar with, but this uh, particular type of flower is, has all kinds of colors. The most popular one is this bright orangey yellow, but it comes in pink and maroon and a light cream color. It's usually planted in the fall for spring flowering. So you'll have those leaves growing all fall and all winter. And then in the spring, you'll get this wallflower. It's technically a perennial, but here in Georgia, of course, we treat it as, as an annual, a hardy annual. And it needs full sun or a little bit of shade in order to bloom properly. If you put the seeds in the ground, 
Again, don't cover them, just sprinkle them in there and they will need light to germinate. And finally, we have bachelor's buttons. Now I just bought a package of these and they're in my refrigerator for five days before I plant them um, because they like to be cold, cold seeds. They need that for their uh, germination to happen. Some people call this corn flower. Now this is a fantastic plant. Listen to the things that it can do. It can be dried and put into an arrangement. It can be eaten and put into salads. It attracts pollinators such as butterflies and bees. It attracts beneficial insects that eat the bad bugs in your garden. The birds eat the seed heads after um, the flowers ha have bloomed then the seed heads become very attractive to the birds to eat. Now you just sow this in the fall in the flower bed and it's also deer resistant. So I think that's gotta be the most important plant of the winter. <laughs> it has all those capabilities and it's, it's a beautiful flower as well. Finally, we have sweet peas and sweet peas are not peas, they're flowers and they vine up. So you've got to give them a trellis or you've got to give them some sort of a vertical net to grow up, but they will decline after it becomes 65 degrees. So you can see they do love those cold temperatures. They are very large seeds though. So the seed coat on this large seed has to be uh, penetrated somehow. You can do this with a knife, which could result in some injuries or you can put them between two pieces of sandpaper and sand down those seed coats a little bit. Or what I do is I soften them overnight in water and soak them. But when you plant these and they start to grow up and the flowers emerge, they smell wonderful. They're so sweetly scented. They're kind of old fashioned flowers you can put these along a chain link fence or any kind of fence that you have growing upward. And how beautiful would that be during the winter? Okay, so those were our um, seeds that, that you can grow. And now we're gonna talk about kale and cabbage, both ornamental. Now, just look at that pot. Isn't that beautiful? You don't miss pansies looking at that. And I think this one is a fall pot because I see some chrysanthemums in there, but you could change it out for something else. These are hardy annuals, just like the pansies. They can take the coldest cold and they can withstand um, a frost and very cold temperatures, which actually makes the colors come out even more. But don't buy these to eat because ornamental cabbage and ornamental kale have been um, developed to look good but not to eat. They're very bitter and the leaves are very tough. So these are something you're gonna plant to see, not to eat. They really are fantastic though, in plantings with the pansies and other winter flowers. The characteristics are the cabbage leaves are smooth and the kale leaves are crinkled and frilly, but we kind of use them interchangeably, just like we did with, um, the pansies and the violas, we just use that term. Well, we'll use ornamental cabbage, ornamental kale interchangeably. Why are they so special? Well, they come in purple. I'm gonna go back to that. They come in purple and they come in all these temperatures, uh, uh, colors, red, pink, green, white. They hold up to the very coldest winter days that we can have here in Georgia. But when the temperatures drop below 50 degrees, they get brighter and brighter colors. They can be put right in the garden bed or put them in a container. They're readily available at garden centers and all kinds of plant nurseries. So it's not something you have to drive around to look for, you'll see them. They grow to be about 18 inches tall and wide. Um, and they just have a magnificent look to them. Here are some varieties. Now, you, you would think cabbage and kale would be a little more boring, but no, look at these. They look like rosettes of uh, flowers. The ones in the center, the white and the pink frilly ones, 
that's a called that's a peacock um, series that someone developed. The ones on the left and right, those have um, very bright colors and different color leaves on the outside. So you know, if you're into matching colors or making your pots have um, a color scheme. There's all kinds of ornamental kale and cabbage out there for you to use. Even the one on the bottom right that looks like a cabbage head or it looks like a, a rosette that has a bluish green color. That's a unique color, but it's really beautiful. How do you grow these? Well, they need full sun, just like the pansies or part shade, just like the violas. They need soil pH to 5.8, 6.5, so they would work in your perennial garden. They would work in your pansy bed. So they're very versatile, but they do need some enriched soil. So get some compost in there and um, make it moist and well-drained wherever you put it. It looks best if you plant it in a mass planting or put it in a container with other plants that will showcase that um, ornamental cabbage. You can pair it with uh, those snapdragons or any of the cool season flowers that you buy for the winter. And the pansies um, can match those colors that we looked at a minute ago. So it's really a versatile and wonderful plant. As you can see on the left, that is just striking. It looks formal. And they've taken two colors of the ornamental cabbage and made a pattern out of it. And it just looks really lovely and it will last all winter long. Now the ornamental um, cabbages and the edible kale are completely different, but they're all beautiful, aren't they? These are the ornamental at the top and you don't wanna eat these, but the edible kale that one on the left is red boar kale and the one on the right is a dinosaur kale. They're just as pretty to me as the ornamental ones, but they would have the added benefit of being edible. So let's go into the edible category. Veggies and herbs for height, color, texture, and vegetative element in your plantings. There's gonna be four that we talk about, Swiss chard, mustards, cardoon, which maybe you've never heard of, and herbs. Now here's Swiss chard, and it almost looks unreal because the stems of this rainbow shard, or chard, depending on how you say it, uh, the, they just have colors of their own. Imagine putting this with some pansies and an ornamental cabbage and maybe something to dangle over the edge of the pot, and there you have it. It's a beautiful thing. And guess what? You can eat this. It's really nutritious and delicious vegetable. Um, there's a bright lights variety and that includes red, yellow, magenta, cream. And it's always the stems that are bright colors but the leaves are different colors depending on you know which variety you get. But I recommend growing Swiss chard um, to eat and to look at both. There are edible mustard greens and they come in pretty colors, mostly in the burgundies and greens, but they have such lovely shapes, frilly or ruffled edges. Um, you wanna start these seeds in the fall or you can buy the plants. You can put them on your deck and you can go out with a pair of scissors and cut your salad because they're very delicious in a salad. Every few weeks, uh, put some new ones in for a new crop throughout the whole winter. They do need some sun though. So they'll need part sun or full sun, whatever you've got out there and put them in good potting soil if you're putting them in a pot. So they have lots of new nutrients. Here's cardoon. Now this is new to me, but I did see one last year growing at the edge of a, a shopping center. And I thought, what is that? It, it's fairly tall. It gets three to five feet tall with these leaves that are um, serrated gray edged leaves. They're just beautiful. But some people call it artichoke thistle and some people call it ornamental artichoke. 
So it's got a lot of names, but in the end, what you wanna know is that it attracts bees and butterflies. It needs full sun and rich soil, but look at the uh, flower it gets. It's a thistle and it, and it really is a beautiful bright purple flower at the um, end of its season when it's gonna be making its seeds. Um, I think it would be a wonderful addition to a winter garden. And you can buy these in the garden center. So give it a try. If you wanna be really adventuresome, at the bottom you see a jar full of cardoon um, stems that have been cooked and jarred or put in a jar. So you can actually eat this as well. And um, if you do, let me know what you think, because I haven't tried it. <laughs> now let's talk about herbs. Herbs aren't just for the summer. They can grow all winter here in Georgia. And there's rosemary, and it actually gets to be as big as a short shrub, and it will last for a long time. Loves full sun. Those are chives, and you go out with your scissors, cut them off, and make your baked potatoes or whatever you're doing. Here's some sage. Sage it has fuzzy leaves that are really beneficial in a pot. If you're so inclined, you can have some sage in there and it will spill over the edge of the pot. It looks really pretty. And of course it's delicious. Uh, finally, we, we've got our thyme here and thyme grows short on the ground. And there's so many varieties of thyme. Lemon thyme, caraway thyme, mother thyme, woolly thyme, all these different ones have different flavors, but they have a lot of the same uh, properties in terms of growing. And this one's oregano. I recommend putting it in a pot because it spreads a lot, but um, it's, it's real hardy here. And then we have our parsley. And parsley is actually a biennial. So the first year, um, when you buy it in the garden center, it's probably a second year and it's gonna to try to get some flowers at the end and then it'll be done. But um, it's so delicious to have fresh parsley in your uh, food as you cook. The lavender, which is mentioned at the bottom of this list, I don't have a picture of that, but if you wanna know all about lavender, our North Fult Fulton Master Gardeners YouTube site has a really good class on it, all about the different kinds of lavender and how to grow it. Okay, so. Now it's time to talk about containers. Maybe you don't have a big garden or you don't want to get out there in the winter and bend over and dig, but you just want a few pots. Well, let's see what we can do. You get your flowers that you're going to put in or your um, annuals or your evergreen perennials, grasses, ferns, all of those things can go in a pot and your pot needs to be clay or plastic or metal or ceramic. But if you use a clay pot, make sure it's glazed because the pots can actually crack during the winter. But the most important thing is it has to have drainage holes and that will let the water out so that the roots just don't sit there in water because that will kill your plant. And then you've got your potting mix some people call it container mix. Some people call it potting soil, but you want one that's good and, and drains well and is a fluffy mixture so the roots can get down into it. And if it has mycorrhizae, which is a fungus, that's a positive because that allows the roots to take up water much, much more easily and it aids the plant in growth. What is a successful container? Well, if you'll look at the one on the left and the one on the right, they have sort of some of the same elements. They have a thriller, which is a upright and showy plant. And in the one on the left, you'll see the ornamental kale sticking up with some, um, with a grass actually. The one on the right, you'll see a little evergreen. The filler is what's all fluffy in the middle. And that's mostly where the colorful flowers come in. You'll see pansies on the left and pansies on the right. And then the spiller hangs over the edge of the plant. And there's a, 
On the left, you'll see that light green one hanging down. That's a creeping Jenny. And on the right, there is a holly that is gonna kind of spill over eventually. These two have kind of a theme. The one on the left to me looks more like fall and Thanksgiving. And the one on the right looks more like a Christmassy or holiday winter type of um, arrangement. So, you know, you can make your pots have different personalities, if you will. So that's a successful container design, but you can always break the rules, you know? They can be simple. This is just alyssum with some dianthus. This one is some dwarf snapdragons with a um, ornamental kale stuck in the front. I would probably put a spiller on that one if I had done that, but this one is um, an ornamental kale with dianthus and it just looks really good. The colors look good together. So make sure that you think outside the box, you know, don't just buy annuals. You might want to use a winter vegetable or a perennial in there, or even an herb. Make use of all the grasses that you can see that are evergreen. Up at the top, that's a chorus, which is a, a grass that stays that color all winter. If you look um, on the right, you'll see some ferns and they are evergreen ferns. If you look on the left bottom, you'll see those are the ornamental cabbages with a, a trailer there. And then on the right, you'll see um, some evergreens and perennials stuck in there. You'll see a hookara, which is a coral bell and some other um, evergreen perennials. And they all just look different, but they all look really beautiful. Now this one has a grass called ribbon grass that, that's spilling over the edge. And then you'll see there's some Swiss chard up at the top and you'll see some kale and pansies. On the right, you'll see parsley, which looks really good, I think. And there's also um, a lot of pansies in that one with some sort of a small shrub. I don't know what that is in the center, but um, you wanna tuck those plants in really, really close for a nice full look because the roots actually are happy to be next to each other. They, they don't need to be far apart and it'll utilize different textures that will accent one another when they're close together. So there are evergreen perennials that you can use. Lamb's ears is one of my favorites. It's on the left and it's real fuzzy leaves, stays green all winter and you can utilize that um, in your landscape really easily. And they live in the summer and they look fine in the winter. If it gets real rainy and wet, sometimes they melt a little bit, but um, they're pretty reliable plants. The bottom, you'll see a cyclamen and a cyclamen actually blooms in the winter. And this is one that I have that's in a pot that I keep outside and then if it gets to be below say 20 degrees, I bring it in and put it back out. So it's one of those you might wanna have protection for, but it's, it's a gorgeous color. Um, the Lenten rose and the ferns. Now the Lenten rose, I'm gonna say, if you're gonna grow one of these, put it in a pot. Don't put it out in your woods because it is invasive, but it, there are a lot of varieties now that they've grown that aren't as invasive and have interesting leaves and beautiful colored flowers. Um, so uh, if you're gonna grow a Lenten rose, it will bloom in January. And so that's the unique thing about that. And then the ferns, there are a lot of evergreen native Georgia ferns. And um, I'm just gonna mention some to you. There's a Christmas fern that gets really tall. There's a marginal fern marginal wood fern, sorry, ebony spleen wart, rock cap fern, and resurrection fern, as well as this one that kind of appears in the fall and it's called grape fern. All of those are native plants to Georgia and you could have them in your landscape with some beautiful green uh, fern fronds all winter. Now, 
if you look on the right, you'll see there are some perennials and cool season annuals mixed together. And this just planted this. This this is um, hasn't even started to grow yet. It's just been put in the ground. Lots of amended soil there, you can see. And there's a um, on the left side, uh, there is a sweet William, which is a dianthus. And then you can see a lamb's ear and a couple of ornamental kales. That light green, lime green color is a foxglove that will grow in a couple of months to be a beautiful flower. And then there are some pansies. So after a month, this filled in completely and was just a beautiful um, bed. Now you might wanna be thinking about your containers in the winter time and some of your, your plants that you might wanna protect. How do you protect cold, uh, extremely cold uh, conditions? How do you protect your plants? First thing you're gonna do, this sounds like the wrong thing, but believe me, it works. Water them. Before that cold hits, when it's gonna be you know, 20 degrees or below, water your plants because then they can take up the water, they can protect themselves from drought. If the crown of the plant freezes or the roots get a little bit frozen, the plant can't take up water and it actually dies of drought during those cold, cold days. So give it some water. Uh, make sure the plant is healthy and fertilized because it can withstand this much more easily if it's a healthy plant. And stop feeding it in the late fall because those brand new roots that um, fertilizer will promote will freeze. So, you know, let the plant be on its own, but make sure you give it water. Now, if you're, you have a pot, you're worried about it, you can just set it right into some pine straw and the pine straw around the pot will protect it. But if you think you need to cover your plant, there are lots of ways to do that. There's commercial floating covers that don't touch the plant, but they, they have hoops that the um, cover goes over the pot or even all, all along your rows of plants in the ground. You can use burlap. It's a really good material because it, the air flows through, but it's um, not going to hurt the plant. You can use garden fabric, which is a polypropylene fabric sold at garden centers. And it comes in all different shapes and varieties. And you can put that over your plants or an old sheet. That's actually what a lot of people do. They just throw an old sheet over the ones they're worried about if it's very cold. And finally, even layers of newspapers will work. So those are some things you can do if we're having one of those <laughs> five degree days in Atlanta that don't happen very often. So um, those are some ideas for you to have a beautiful winter landscape. And um, don't forget, you know, there's a lot of perennials out there you can incorporate like the um, ajuga, which is a ground cover that stays green or purple or black or whatever the leaves are. There's euphorbia, which is one of my favorites and also grasses and ferns. So have fun choosing all the different plants that are at your fingertips in the garden center, even seeds that you can incorporate this year and have fun with your winter gardening. So um, I'd like to tell you about some of the resources. These are some books that I had read to present this uh, presentation to you with some information from the books. And the UGA Extension has wonderful information in their publications. So go to the UGA Cooperative Extension website and you can download in a PDF form any of those. I wanna thank our promotional partners. They help us get the word out and our media partners as well. And finally, uh, this is the last virtual class of our season. So I thank you for joining me today. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, fabulous. That was great, Hi, Donna. 
Uh, there are some good questions, some great questions. And if you'll let me uh, toss a few to you that I don't, that either you may not have touched on, but maybe someone else. We go. Uh, what's the best soil location time of year for sweet peas in particular? Uh, this person has tried several years to grow them, but not much success. Uh, she or he lives in 7B zone. Okay. Well, I live in 7B as well. Um, and the success of growing sweet peas is all about having the amended soil. So you have to put in a lot of compost. You have to put in a lot of um, manure that's been composted or chopped up leaves, but you wanna make that soil really fluffy and conducive to um, the roots going down into the soil. Um, and then you provide your upright trellis or uh, fence or frame of some sort for the plants to grow. You might have to tie them up for, at the very beginning to get them started in their upward motion. But they, um, if you plant the seeds, even in October, you will have these plants. So I hope that answers your question. Here's a question uh, from someone about plant zones. Uh, I think you explain uh, the general differences in terms of minimum temperatures between the ones that are close together. But in particular, this person asked, will a plant zone eight plant survive our conditions? Yes, they will. In fact, I used to live in 8B way down there in Georgia and I had a wonderful winter uh, annual garden. So I know that they will survive they will not survive when it gets hot, so you just pull them out. But yes, you can grow a wonderful winter garden in zone eight. So good luck, have fun. <laughs> Another person wants to know if you have uh, two or three recommendations for these cool season perennials, perhaps if they're just starting a garden, what's the one or two, maybe three they should start with that are perennial? Well, I would say um, if you don't want to go the seed route where I had mentioned lots of seeds, um, the ones that are readily available for you, if you're looking for something that's already started and you want to put it in the ground, I would say violas and pansies, ornamental cabbage, ornamental kale, snapdragons, and... Um, you might even find uh, some a hookara, which is a um, coral bell is another name. It's a, a perennial and it stays green all year. And euphorbia, and there's a tall variety. There are different colors of euphorbia. That's a fun one to, to plant as well. Um, those are the most reliable. Dianthus is out there too. And you might find some alyssum that's already been uh, started in the garden center. Most of the things that you see growing in the garden center right now available for you to purchase are winter annuals or winter growing plants. So just talk to the people that are there, uh, that work there and they will be able to help you have a really successful garden and good luck, it'll be fun. Luck is our best asset sometimes. <laughs> yeah. uh, another person uh, asked if you may have touched on what biennials are, but do they die after the second year and do they reseed themselves? Yeah, biennials, um, you know, their, their goal in life is to make a flower in that second year, drop seeds in the ground and make new plants. So they do reseed and they do die after they make their seeds. So when you are growing a biennial, you want to um, time it so that that second year are the flowers. But sometimes when you go to the nursery and you see say a foxglove right now at the nursery, it's a second year plant. So you put it in the ground and it will grow the flower 
next spring or late winter. So you, you can ask your garden center. Um, you know, they, they don't always think we know everything. So they'll make it easy for us. But sometimes that second year plant is ready to bloom uh, and you buy it at the garden center, but then it will be done at the end of that season. Another viewer has asked uh, about the best time to sow seeds for bachelor buttons and maybe for poppies. Well, I'm hoping bachelor buttons can be sown right now because I'm about to do it on Monday. <laughs> but um, from what I've read, they say um, late fall. So late fall in Georgia, to me, is right about now. Uh, you could do it the end of October. You could do it all the way into the middle of November. But, you know, when we start to get those frosty days, um, you want to have the seeds down. And if you do it a little earlier, you might get the, the green sooner, but it can be planted. Uh, your seeds can be planted all the way up until the middle of November. So I hope it works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, this person has a dusty miller that's now almost 18 inches tall and wondering if it can be cut back and will it grow back during the winter? That I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I have some Dusty Miller right now and uh, it just continues to, um, to be beautiful throughout the whole winter. And then when it gets that flower on it in the spring or summertime, actually the end of summer, I just cut the flower off. But in terms of cutting the plant back, I don't know if it will regrow, but you could give it a try. If you have two of them, try one of them, cut back the other one, leave it alone <laughs> and see what happens. I'm a big experimenter when it comes to plants. So maybe you can tell us what happens. Great idea for uh, gardeners in general, experiment. Yes. Uh, here's one that affects all of us. I mean, and we, goodness knows I have too. Uh, here's a person with a lot of deer. Well, this must be everybody who's watching this. <laughs> Maybe 12 to 15, this person says, at a time. Uh, which of these do you have sort of at the top of your mind about being uh, deer resistant? Well, this is a hard question because everything I read that says it's deer resistant, they eat it. So I, um, the, the, the bachelor's buttons said deer resistant on the package. I've never grown them and I'm gonna try it. So there's one, um, they don't like that. Uh, anything with leaves that are spiky. So the cardoon, you know, that tall artichoke, that would work. They don't like anything with fuzzy leaves. So lamb's ears and, um, uh, some of the herbs that are that have a strong taste they don't like. But in terms of the flowers that I mentioned, I'm, I just experiment. And, you know, some years they eat them and some years they don't. It depends on how hungry they are. So I, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you. What you can do, though, is you can get some deer um, pellets that you put around your plants, you have to repeat doing that, but it does uh, repel them because they don't like the smell of it. But when you want a completely deer resistant plant, uh, let me know when you find it. <laughs> <laughs> good point, good point. I, I think yeah. you're right. Some of us have had some good luck with some of this deer repellent um, yeah. uric acid from uh, coyotes or whatever. I guess yeah. that's one good use of coyotes. Yeah, there you um, go. If you, can <laughs> get them to, if you can get them to do that in the right place at the right time, you're in good shape. <laughs> right. um, here's a person who uh, asked in particular uh, if when they sow seeds on the top of the ground, mm -hmm. uh, is there any problem with just the natural falling of the, the oak leaves, the fall leaves that cover them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they need light to germinate. Once they germinate, 
the leaves can fall. But um, for that germination to happen, you know, you want to kind of keep them clear before the germination takes place. Each seed has its own germination time, though. Some take a couple of weeks, some take, you know, less time. But um, until that germination happens, you'll need to kind of monitor it a little bit, just so you don't, because I know the leaves are falling right now and it seems to be ongoing for a few weeks. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, yes, and I've had trouble sometimes uh, in pulling heavy leaves off. I've actually uh, redistributed the seeds just when they were trying to get a good hold on the ground. So it's mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. Uh, I might mention there are several more questions related to deer and deer resistant plants. Uh, I'm aware, you may know of some other uh, sources of information. I also agree with you that if deer get hungry enough, nothing is safe. Yeah. Uh, but that UGA does have some good material available just for Googling and you'll get it about deer resistance unless you have other general thoughts about it. Yeah, we're gonna post on the chat um, the, the publication about deer resistant plants. And um, it's a good one. Uh, I'm, I'm just remembering the cyclamen that I mentioned is supposed to be deer resistant. Although one year they ate mine. So, you know, there you go. But um, do get that University of Georgia Cooperative Extension publication about deer resistant plants. It's written by Gary Wade and he's really knowledgeable and it might help you because you don't want to buy a bunch of things, put them in the ground and then have the deer eat them. You're out the money and you don't have the beauty that you thought you would have. So I understand that concern. One person mentioned what we may have heard that Irish spring um, is a good right. way shaved up out on the lawn. Um, I guess the deer are getting clean, but I've also <laughs> heard different reports about how effective it is. So yeah, uh, I, I've never done that experiment. one. Yeah, the the smell of the soap, I guess, is a deterrent. So you might have some bubbles, but maybe you won't have any deer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So uh, getting closer to the end of our questions here, excellent questions. Um, the uh, the the success that people have in terms of uh, watering seed correctly uh, on top of the ground uh, is, of course, hampered if you wash them all off. So any suggestions about watering the seed that's on the top of the ground? Well, the first thing you would do is you would get the ground really moist before you even put the seeds down. And then um, this time of year, you know, the, the, the sun isn't so intense and hot and drying out the soil. So the soil will stay moist uh, longer than you would have in the summertime. Uh, so you can plant them or sprinkle them on the moist soil. And then um, if you're wanting to water them, I would take a... Um, a spray bottle and spray them wherever you put these seeds and keep them moist that way. If you use a, a hard uh, flow from a hose, they'll just travel. You won't even know where they've gone. And that way, um, if you spray them and keep them moist, keep the soil moist, they'll um, germinate in the light and you'll know where they are. Yep. Uh, speaking of water, uh, one uh, one participant asked the question of how many holes do you put into a container plant? I assume they're talking about a plant where you can put a hole in it pretty easily. Um, I, Tom, can you explain that question a little bit? Because sure. I'm not I, sure. I'm I, guessing uh, that they, you can probably punch nail holes in the bottom of a plastic oh. uh, planter uh, to where you've got maybe close to 100. Or you oh. can put a smaller number or larger okay. holes. I got it. I, I got it. Well, what you need are enough holes to make the water drain out. And uh, I have pots with one hole. I have pots with three holes. And the holes are about as 
big around as a pencil, you know, the, the width of a pencil. So they don't have to be big. You don't need a lot of little holes, just one um, or three is usually plenty. And then sometimes people put a, um, a saucer underneath or a plant caddy to uh, catch the water if they don't want it draining all over their deck or something. But um, you don't have to, you know, just so you get the water out. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a, a good colleague in our organization suggest putting about a half an inch to one inch of heavy gravel in the bottom right. mm -hmm. to sort of keep the, um, the soaking and sucking upward effect of good uh, loamy soil. And mm -hmm. it helps that water to get away toward the bottom. Yeah, uh, last, la yeah last question. Um, there is always the question of uh, how many of these plants are native, which is probably not an easy question to ask given all of the different uh, hybridization activities that are going on uh, well, that try yes. to help plants. Any ideas about uh, native plants of the ones you've talked about? Well, I am just now becoming a native, Georgia native plant enthusiast and I'm just learning about it. So I did mention a few uh, native um, ferns that I just learned about yesterday, or they would be in this slide here. <laughs> they, you would have seen them. Um, in terms of native plants of all of the ones that I mentioned, there are, uh, there are a few. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to um, review this and really look it up because I don't think I had a lot of native plants in here and I would like to have had more. So maybe next year I'll do one with native plants in it. But um, what I'll do is I'll review it and, and answer that question in the form of um, an email to anybody who was on this uh, presentation today, if you're interested. And we can even put it on our website um, as something that you can look for. But that is a really good question and I appreciate you asking it. And I want everybody out there to know that native plants, you know, Georgia native plants are really beneficial to have in your garden. And next spring, we are going to really hit it hard to let you know all about natives in our classes that we're going to be conducting starting in March. You'll learn about how to create a meadow and how to create a landscape in your yard with native plants and some other uh, talks as well. So um, tune in then and you might get some answers even more than what I can give you right now. So thank you. <laughs> And as always, feel free to call us, uh, get in touch with a master gardener or the extension office, not just in North Fulton, but others around the state, if you need more help. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, Donna, fabulous. Thank you and everybody, happy gardening in the winter. I hope you have success and I hope I taught you something new. Um, it's been wonderful being with you. Thank you. <laughs>